I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Hornady Podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I'm joined today, uh, full table here to my left, Judge Jarzinka, across the table, Preston Lentford, fellow marketeers, and we're joined by Miles Neville, project engineer here at Hornady. Guys, thanks for sitting around the table with me. Howdy. You bet. I'm excited to talk about today's topic, and I'm excited to talk about any topic, really. Doing podcasts is fun. This is a fun one, though, because... It's something I'm pretty pretty passionate about, something that I think we all share a passion about, and that is custom-built rifles. That's something that, for me, that gets me going. I don't know about anybody else, but I can say uh, it's one of the things that gets me through the day, you know, just the, the, the mental geometry of picking out stuff and making the right choice and wondering about what should I do and what component and whatever really just, uh, I don't know, keeps my mind busy. And I need that. Yep. I That started for me back in tech. Mm-hmm. Just getting through the day, let's let's dream about what the next build is going to be or what I'm going to change on whatever. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's a good point because in tech, just to give you guys a uh, uh, behind the scenes at Hornady, uh, so we've got a technical staff, we've talked about them. You know, there's a bunch of dudes upstairs to answer your questions, whether that be what bullet choice or I don't know how to use this or what reloading technique or whatever. Well, you're, you're married to a desk when you do that because you're married to your phone. And when you sit there for eight or nine hours a day, you have to keep your mind busy. Uh, and yeah, dreaming about building rifles and ordering stuff and making component selections really makes the day go by fast for me. And a lot of the times you're answering questions that aren't necessarily about our products, but shooting in general. Mm-hmm. So I like to be well-versed as I possibly could, and that just helped me. Uh, oh yeah give good advice because yeah. a lot of times advice would be like oh well, what do you shoot oh well, what yeah well let me tell you increases the depth of knowledge there absolutely yep, yep. awesome love it judd are you a are you a fellow custom rifle guy i'm a little bit on the other direction here i'm i'm looking forward to feeling your guys's energy and uh getting my ball rolling here because i've dabbled a little bit i've done some stock changes but i've i've yet to dive into the full custom rifle build so mm. i'm looking to be convinced. You yeah, need some be convincing. Con- well, yeah, be convinced, but I'm excited for it here. So we'll see if uh, you guys can uh, get me to start the build. Hey, well, and if nothing else, you know, we can talk through why somebody might want a custom rifle and the fact that factory built rifles today are, I mean, you can get some darn good factory rifles out there for significant cost savings versus going custom that can do a lot of great things. I mean, there are some fantastic factory rifles out there, and for the most part, might be all a guy needs. But there is something cool. Now, Miles, you're a little bit more heavily vested in the custom rifle game than I've, even the rest of us here at work, and so you've got to have a, an interesting angle on that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's It used to be a lot more necessary, I think, to get the precision that you want, you know, that we're striving for, to get the utmost precision that last little bit. Um, but yeah, I think you're right that factory rifles today are better than they ever have been in the past. Uh, and yeah, just, I think that's across the board, bullets, barrels, everything that we're making today has got technological advances in the way those are made that that's really helped out. Mm -hmm. Well, from me and Preston being like, yeah, we like to have custom rifles. We like to put the parts together to Judd where, you know, he's changing some stocks, maybe switching out triggers and kind of tuning up a factory rifle. On the other hand, you have miles who physically built precision rifles uh with you know lathes and mills and doing all sorts of custom work and cerakote and obviously you're a degreed mechanical engineer so that's not your your uh, way that you make money but you still are a gifted machinist and let me just say for all of us thank you for working here because you've helped (laughs) our dreams come true um so talk a little bit about how you got into precision rifle building and that hobby and uh just yeah go go through that with us uh yeah so when i was in the marine corps uh it's basically like all discretionary budget i can they take care of your housing and your food so every bit of money i made i was i had an allotment every month that i bought gun stuff and sent it back home to mom and dad and then after my five years active was up i came home and started playing with it so about as soon as i 
got out of the Marine Corps, started going to college. Uh, I just started shooting long range. That's when I really got into it heavy. Okay. And, uh, and then you, back then you would have, you kind of needed to build a custom rifle to get that level of level of precision. Yeah, I would, I would say so. Yeah. Um, and, and so I had a custom rifle built, uh, towards the tail end of my enlistment and then got it started playing around with that mm, right after I got out. Um, and then went to college there, uh, in Rapid City, uh, South Dakota School of Mines. And while I was there, uh, donated some time basically to a local rifle building shop and kind of learned the ropes there. Um, and got into it just hard and heavy basically. Um, but yeah, that was able to learn all the ins and outs of, you know, see the behind the scenes stuff of, of what everybody, you know, when you, you send a pile of parts off and then it comes back as an assembled rifle, I got to see that, how that whole transition happens basically awesome. and learn the ins and outs of that. Well, I'm glad you brought that with you here to Hornady because yeah, you've, not just in, in the building rifles and, and chambering barrels and such, but just in metal working uh, and in just general, yeah, being a very competent machinist, uh, you've got that skill in spades. So you must have picked on picked up on that pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And actually, while I was in the Marine Corps, I had a, uh, I bought a little metal, uh, mini metal lathe that I hid in a sea bag in my barracks room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I had to hide it for inspections. Uh and then would pull it out whenever and and taught myself how to cut threads, how to, you know, whatever, cut to diameters, turn and cut tapers, whatever. Just the basics of a lathe. I taught all that to myself basically with YouTube. Wow. And a uh, little mini grizzly lathe that I bought. That's fantastic. And uh, <laughs> so a self-starter, motivated and a gifted machinist and much deeper in the custom rifle world than us. So before we get into talking about custom rifles and component selection and all that i think we should spend a little bit talking about the higher level you're getting ready to buy a factory rifle or build a custom rifle there's kind of a few things you need to nail down before you start your selection and for me that is what is my intended purpose what am i trying to shoot how far away is it and then that those three things guide caliber and cartridge selection so what are what what do you guys use? We can go around the table here as kind of your criteria to to start picking that out, whether that's a factory rifle or you're building a custom one. I think just for like caliber selection, basically to to get you going, I start with the target. What's the target that I'm going to be shooting, and then what what does that require? So if it's shooting a steel plate, and all that counts is I hit the steel plate, then the energy requirements are nil. It mm -hmm. just has to make it there. And then, the, you know, you have that feedback loop of what's the target, how far away is it, uh, what are the conditions you're going to be shooting it in, or carrying the rifle or not carrying the rifle or whatever. That's kind of where it starts. And then that gets you, how big of a bullet do I need, what kind of class of bullet do I need, and then how much case do I need behind it to get that bullet propelled, what velocity uh, range do I need. How fast do I need to make yeah, it go. how fast does it got to go. Yep. And it's, yeah, that's the super quick response. But it doesn't need to be a whole lot more in depth than that because that's that works every time. Yeah, and I mean, there's minutia to that. There's, uh, do I get my velocity through barrel length? Do I get it through putting more powder behind the bullet? You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a little bit of give or take here, and everybody's got their own preference there. That's a, a lot of it comes down to point of personal yeah. preference. Yeah, well, there's a lot of mental geometry there too because if you want velocity, and let's say you do that by increasing the barrel length. You just increase the weight depending on con all, you know, yeah. contour remaining the same. So you've got that velocity, but you've got extra weight. Versus. Let's say you want a shorter barrel, but you still want that same velocity. You just increase recoil because you got more powder behind that bullet. So there's a lot of mental geometry. Yep. A lot of times it's about finding balance. I think at this point, a lot of us are at the point of, well, we'll just have one for each scenario. And yeah. You know, just go all out the way. So you're it should uh, be done. once for one for each scenario. Judd, are you more of a utilitarian? I, I one rifle to rule them all, or how are you going about this? <laughs> so what I want to add here is, uh, everybody keep in mind that I'm a level two or three below these other guys here sitting at the table. So honestly, what's cool? What's hot? What yeah. what what's you know the the jazz right now? So you you know six arc that that's cool. Six five Creedmoor, six Creedmoor, you know PRCs. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of more on that train of, hey, that that's a cool cartridge. It looks sweet, does the job. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going with. You know, so yeah, there is some cool factor to it. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about going through and making Excel documents and doing whatever. 
you really can't quantify the cool factor, but you, you bring that up, Judd, you do feel warm and fuzzy when it's like, oh yeah, that 300 PRC, that's the, that's the ticket. Mainly, you know, it's got a ton of external and terminal uh, characteristics that just make it fantastic, but it's also got the cool factor yeah. that, that that's really cool. Yeah. And that's like, realistically, if you keep it inside of 400 yards, which is most all, almost all the hunting that takes place in the United States, any medium to large caliber hunting cartridge is going to work. Is going to work for you. Yeah. You can make it work. It's not like, oh, you know, you need this to make it work. Very rarely does that come into play. Yep. It's, yeah. So, uh, if, if you're out there, you've probably done this as well. Uh, we do it here. So you identify your target, how far away it is, what requirements that brings along. So you pick a caliber and you pick a cartridge. Now you start getting into where we all kind of started is you buy, you know, the, you buy the factory rifle and there's some amazing factory rifles out there, but then you start, man, that trigger, that trigger's not exactly what, what I want. And usually for me in my earlier days, the trigger was one of the first things to swap out because there's some great aftermarket stuff out there. And uh, to me, I feel like there's some good accuracy improvements to be had, not with the rifle system specifically, but me as the shooter, you know, the nut behind the bolt is usually what's loose. And with a little bit nicer trigger, I can usually shoot just, just better all the way around. I don't know. You guys, do you have a different order of operations for me it's trigger then stock i i remember a time we were both in tech still and uh my brother had got a 30-06 budget rifle i don't know if you remember this yes and i didn't particularly want to spend the money on a new trigger for it which there was only one i think you could get and we tried clipping some springs and we ended up taking that trigger from, I believe it was six to seven pounds from the factory down to maybe five. Mm -hmm. And this whole 30-06 with the pencil barrel probably weighed seven like, or eight pounds. With the scope total, on it With the scope and everything. And it was just still unshootable. So triggers, until you start getting down there in weight, I think that's where you see that improvement. Uh, but going from a heavy trigger to a slightly less heavy but still heavy trigger may not do it and and shootability of that rifle definitely yeah uh, was an issue but it's easier to manipulate that trigger without influencing the 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 yep. point of aim when it's just a little bit lighter uh more consistent pull weight you know exactly when it's going to break yep so for me you buy that factory rifle and i remember shooting a bunch of them and you try to tune up a factory trigger get the aftermarket trigger there's usually some some gains to be had there Yep. I think I don't know. I'm I'm not too trigger picky. Um, I I it's obviously better, but uh, better to have a better trigger, obviously. But yeah, uh, I look at it mostly. First thing I look at is the barrel. Does does this barrel shoot? And if it doesn't, then I'm I'm Moving starting on. I'm starting to look to yeah replace the barrel. Okay. Well, I guess I I agree. And originally I was not trigger picky, virtually at all. And then I got pickier and pickier. But and, it's easy to change the trigger. Yeah. As somebody who's not a, a who gun, can't throw up a barrel in a lathe and chamber it and thread it. Yeah, triggers pretty easy. We can easy change to the trigger, the trigger well, easily. For me, it was. I remember saying this out loud. I can shoot a heavy trigger as good as I can shoot a lot a lighter trigger. It just takes me longer, right? Because you're starting to have to interrupt that trigger squeeze, and it just takes a lot longer and a lot more focus. So yep. it's just yeah, a little easier now on the stock side of things. That's another one I was real quick to swap out on a factory rifle. Not all factory rifles need it, especially today. But, you know, years ago when we were just getting started, you know, you buy that, that rifle and it turns out it shoots well, but it's kind of got a piece of Tupperware on it. And yep. for me, that's, that was one of the other things uh, that I swapped out. Instant ergonomic increase. What do you guys think? Yeah, so that, that's about as far as I've gone so far. Is, uh, on a factory rifle, I have switched stocks a couple times uh i had a ruger predator still have it and i put a magpul hunter stock on there and really really liked it uh and then i don't know just was ready for a change so you know that's the neat thing i guess to me on the custom side of things is okay change it you know just like we've been talking so i uh moved that down the road and went with a bell and carlson stock on there now and and really enjoy it. Gave it more of a hunter profile. Yep. Uh, more traditional look. But yeah, I, I've, I've switched stocks out and, uh, 
I don't, I, I'm on a different level from you guys. I'll say again, but, uh, just appearance. I thought it yeah. looked cool. So I I'll went s- ahead. I'll second that, that the Bell and Carlson stock for those Ruger American predators. It's got a classic, you know, lines look of a traditional hunting stock, but it's comfortable and increases the shootability and the cool, yeah. cool ability. Yeah. The cool ability, but let's admit it, that, that rifle of yours, that sucker is a shooter. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it shoots really well for a factory rifle and an affordable one at that. Yeah, it, it has. So, and probably uh, from not the best caretaker either of a rifle, but that sucker still shoots, which is which well, is awesome. Six five Creedmoor, throw the suppressor on there and go to shooting. Won't yeah. be let down. Yeah, heck yeah. So when the stock and the the trigger isn't enough for you, Miles, you mentioned it when that barrel just it's not shooting that well. Um, so getting into the custom rifle thing, you don't always need a custom action. You can take your factory action and you can get it rechambered uh, with a different barrel. What are you guys looking at uh, on the building side of things? Are you into truman up actions? Do you believe in that for the general guy? Um, and then barrels, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. The truing actions thing, I think, is mostly a theoretical argument. Um I haven't been on the inside of the, of the back, you know, behind the curtains kind of thing, seeing that side of things. I, I don't know. We would get actions in that somebody else had trued up and, and everybody does it the same way. They usually put two bushings in the raceway of the receiver and then they run a ground steel rod that's perfectly straight or as close as you can get through those bushings. And so what you're looking for is to indicate off the center line of the receiver. And then you indicate that in two places as you spin it around so that everything's running true with the spindle bore of the lathe. And then like some guys will even indicate it with the spindle of a mill, right? And they'll thread mill and, and clean up the threads. And usually what they're looking to do, you clean up the receiver face, the lug abutments inside the receiver, and then the threads, the barrel threads where the barrel screws in. Um, and get all those perfectly true to some theoretical center line, right? And uh, I... I don't think it effectively like makes a difference that anybody can shoot. I've never seen any documented like proof that it other than completely wrecked examples of receivers that it yeah. makes a difference or things that are borderline unsafe to actually use. Yeah. Yeah. But, I think as, I mean, cause the, the thing is like what you'll see, what you, people will talk about is like lug engagement. So you talk like, Oh, well the, the top lug has 20% engagement. The bottom lug has 40% engagement after I drew it up. They're both at a hundred percent. I think as long as those two lugs are engaged and they're supporting the case, uh, yeah, you have a hard time. You have a hard time seeing an improvement. I've I've even seen like Lee Enfields that are rebarreled with good barrels. They're notorious for having uh, the bore of the rifle misaligned to the uh, to the bolt face. Wow! And so you fire those, and you can set the case up, and it's standing at an angle on the table. Uh, and they still shoot. Wow. So yeah. the alignment well, part of it, I don't think, yeah. Don't get hung up Yeah, on yeah, it. Theoretically, it's better. Obviously, theoretically, you want to do everything you can. I think it's mostly a placebo, a feel-good, like, yeah. peace of mind. That's yeah. that's what most of that is. Well, there's is. something to be said about that, too. If I can, if my brain can trick me into shooting better or feeling yeah. better if or If you whatever. believe in it, then then rock and roll. You know, that's, yeah. You if, gotta if believe that, in yourself. If that's what. Look good, yeah. feel good, shoot good. Yeah. yeah. If that's what it does, if right. that's what you need to get her done, then then go ahead and, and do it. Uh, personally, I think you spin the same barrel onto a untrued receiver where the lugs are making contact and one that's been trued up, you're going to see almost identical performance downrange. Interesting. All else being equal, yeah. That's My it. first competition rig had maybe 10% engagement or 0% engagement on one of the lugs. And, and it, it shot great. It did. I remember that rifle. That thing pounded. But Back reaction. Yeah, to jump on on miles's truing thing in my opinion i mean maybe five six years ago it was still worthwhile i think today with the even the the custom actions and their budget models i think you're going to spend as much for a great custom budget action let's say an an arc nucleus on sale or a bighorn origin the mac brothers evo. mac, mac brothers, brothers evo. evo yeah there's tika you're going to spend stiller. the same money stiller yep truing like an old remington 700 that you would just to buy that yeah, yeah that's and, true and that kind of i don't know if you're ready to jump into this but that leads us to prefits oh gosh which is 
But that that is the Huge. only reason you and I are really involved in the custom. Yeah, that's rifle why game. we're builders. Because <laughs> of prefits. <laughs> yeah, and we can we can jump into that. So uh, if you're out there, you got the factory action, and and you want it rebarreled into either a new cartridge or something that's going to shoot a little bit better. Yeah, you know if you can get it trued up, theoretically it's a great idea if things are more true. Um, you know machinists can hold much tighter tolerances than are actually useful in general gunsmithing for the most of it. Uh, but if you're ready to make that switch to a custom action, what do you guys think a custom action gains you over a factory action? Feel. Feel? Oh, yeah. Feel. That's, I think that's the main thing. Feel. Yeah. I'll piggyback on that. Feel and prefits. Yeah. Prefit yeah. Run. run Savage. Get well, you, barrel you nut can, prefit. but I mean, that's antiquated at this point. Almost. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, that's one of those things where, like Judd was saying, you got to feel cool. Yeah. So in feel, you're not talking like actual function, the feel of the function. You're talking uh, like, just there's 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 some things to it, like the the timing, the timing of the bolt lift and primary extraction. Like on a custom, you can almost guarantee that that's done right. On some factory guns, there's some aftermarket. Like on a Remington 700, right? Like before, I would do a full true job. I would just have the the bolt handle taken off of the bolt and have it timed up correctly by somebody that knows what they're doing and have that soldered and ticked back on and that will make the biggest improvement in how that rifle cycles the feel of running the bolt that'll sure. make yeah that'll make the biggest improvement you'll get out of the whole thing like functionally you you'll feel that and you'll notice a difference noted um and then there's some other things like some of the the scope mount screws the mm -hmm. scope base screws that come in some of the factory rifles are pretty dainty like oh, you, 648 yeah yeah and you run the chance of if they're and sometimes the screw holes are not lined up the front ring and the rear ring are in different locations and it binds up the base uh yeah, yeah there's little improvements there that are worth it i think those are the two big ones that i would do if you have a Remington yeah. 700 open those up to number yeah. eight yep. and then uh yeah and then have the bolt timed and ticked yeah, but on the factory action side, yeah, the, the running of the bolt is smoother, but then you also kind of get your choice of, you want controlled round feet, right. do you want, you know, what kind of extractor do you want? You want 70 degree throw, you yeah. want three yeah. lug action. Yep, yep, you can get three lug, two lug, uh, you can get it cut for AW magazines, AICS, uh, you can have, you know, bottom metal, uh, Wyatt's extended box, yeah. you know, there's a ton yeah, of options. Yeah, so... What, once you go custom, the the spectrum of options available to you is overwhelming. And, and material. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, different materials. Yep. Yeah. Stainless, uh, chrome moly, nitride, uh, heat treat. Titanium. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So the last thing I want to say on the on the factory action side before we go into a little bit more uh, discussion on custom actions, uh, years ago when I was running, yeah, primarily factory actions, and I would lap scope rings in. Uh, which again, not a lot of people do anymore. It seems like, and I had uh, somebody tell me, you know, that's if you buy good rings, that's not necessary. And my response was, I'm not lapping these rings in for the ring quality. It's because that this action, like you mentioned, those screws that hold the scope base, or and if you're using one piece rings and bases, that is likely not perfectly true. Like it's going to be on something completely custom and higher quality. So right. you get stepped up into that custom action. Yeah. Just, you, yeah. There's a lot more plug and play options and yeah. a lot less fiddling with little things. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, you get one piece rails for some factory actions and it's like you push, hold it tight on the front, hold it tight on the rear. And that way it rail just sits there and yeah. teeter totters. You got to bet it. Yeah. yeah. Bet a scope so you rail. Have, I remember fine. your scope rail on, on I had your to, first one was, yeah. so there get, was a, I don't know, my first, over a 16th of JB weld on yeah, that. My back. first, uh, bust out the masking tape and JB weld. My yeah. first, uh, yeah, my first, uh, semi-custom rifle was a factory barrel action i played around with it a bunch and really cut my teeth shooting it in 2013 and 2014 and i shot it in several ma many matches actually uh and yeah the i had that was actually true devcon like it wasn't jb well that, that was real stuff that was real devcon i had to bed that scope base in there a lot uh and it was yeah it's just one of those deals but it again it ended up shooting great it was a fantastic mm -hmm. shooting rifle but so from a uh sorry Judd, i, I want to dive in here a little bit it might be a rabbit hole but so coming from the factory side i've changed some stocks i haven't noticed you, you know an issue like yeah uh, again you probably is there well, theoretical <laughs> yeah maybe but i'm trying to like is there a distance where you would say some of this would come into effect so like uh, as far as game goes i've i've taken two critters over 300 yards everything else is yeah. 150 
and I and I felt perfectly comfortable, confident. Well, so like with you know, a lap in the rings, doing all this. Would you say like, could could you put a number on it, a distance? Like, it comes down. It comes down to accuracy, expectation. I think, uh, and and what and and requirement, right? So if you're plugging a deer or an antelope 300 yards or in or a coyote or whatever you have, you know, um, your accuracy requirements are different from a guy who's going to go shoot PRS where you got targets out to 1400 yards. Yeah. Um, and, and that guy probably shoots a lot more too. So right, me, right. yet so, to shoot a match, I'll shoot, you know, for hunting, I'll, I'll do some practicing through the off season. Well, I'll check the say, gun before yeah, season. That, then I go. So my you, round count for a year is, Probably but not that Ruger, you've stretched out. I mean, it, yeah. it plumb shoots. You've ran it out to 800,000 yeah. yards. And that's that's another thing. With the factory rifles, I, I like to uh, say you have a spectrum of components that you'll get. You'll have barrels that shoot just as good as any custom barrel ever, and that's a small portion of them. You'll get most of them that shoot just a little bit worse, and then you'll get some of them that are not good at all. And and that's what you get. That's that's There's a... There's always, you're, when you go full custom, you're past the point of diminishing returns. Like that's a price first performance and like you get a ton and then it kind of just drops off and you get like a little bit more performance, but you're spending a, a ton more money. So there, there's definitely that going on. Um, but yeah, you got that spectrum of, of you, you got a good shooting gun. Okay. And, and that spectrum has changed over the last several years. Uh, like in the 1990s, that was a totally different world where like, you buy a custom, you know, just go buy a factum, a factory Remington 700, whatever. Uh, if you're shooting under two inches, you're doing good. You know, if you're hand loading, getting under an inch, like you nailed it. Right. And now the expectation is it needs to shoot under an inch for some of these like PRS competition, stuff like that. Now for hunting, that never changed. Right. If you're shooting, you're hitting a baseball, every shot at a hundred yards roll, you know, you're good. But yeah, I think to answer your question specifically, I don't think there is a specific range that you'd see that stuff because, again, a lot of it's theoretical. And I think, uh, at least for me, like bedding the scope base and lapping the scope rings in, I wasn't necessarily trying to fix anything on the rifle. That was trying to set the optic up to be the most useful. Right. And I didn't want to torque the tube and mess something up. Yeah, and I guess, and, and there's some stuff there's some stuff there. So, like, if, you're, if your bedding is jacked up and when you torque your rear action screw, it turns your receiver into a banana then you'll maybe see some issues with how the bolt cycles or you might even induce some accuracy issues. Like you might, if your stock fit is really loose and it, it just doesn't mesh right, there's binding, then you might see horizontal stringing or some other, you know, issue with that. Um, I'm, and then, I'm, can, I, can I jump in here real quick? I'm going to answer it in a different way, I think, too. Let's say you have a complete custom rifle and it shoots a, a true 10-shot group into three-quarters of an inch. And your Ruger American shoots 10 shots into three quarters of an inch and you've done nothing to it. And you have data for both. You're going to hit, you could, Miles could, maybe not me, I'm not that good of a shooter, but Miles could take both guns and shoot at X amount of yards equally as good. It just might be a little bit longer to get him adjusted, you know, to the, to the ergonomics, the ergonomics trigger, trigger. Stock. but equally they could shoot just as good downrange say everything shoots the same close up yeah yeah it just feels better it's easier yeah. to do well and then if but you bought both of them could do it and if you bought 10 of those factory rifles and built 10 custom rifles with the exact same components i think the accuracy over the average is going to be significantly more consistent with custom. Yep. So yep. yep awesome i think we yep. we rode that out pretty well and i want to shift gears now into the custom side of things but get into a little bit more of selection you know what, uh, so you're into the, the custom action, you decide you're getting a custom action. You know, for me, one of the things that I like about the actions that I choose, uh, not all of them that I have, but a couple of them is the control round feed. I, I like that, uh, that feature, if you will, especially on a hunting rifle. Um, what do you guys look for in a, in an action when you're trying to decide, okay, what about this one versus this one? Uh, for me, it's it's mainly materials and okay. and execution well, of the machining. Uh, I like interchangeable bolt heads. Yeah, that's that's yeah. The you're bolt not so, so much worried about 
feeding mechanism or what kind of extractor it has or dual ejectors? Or uh, yeah, like I look that. at extractors. Like, uh, I like American Rifle Company. I'm pretty partial to their stuff. And they've got big, beefy extractors. The control round feed is nice, but I don't, I'm not hung up on it. Mm-hmm. Um, replaceable bolt head is awesome because then you can go 223, 300 blackout, standard 6.5 Creedmoor base, and then you can go up to the PRCs, the short PRCs, all in one action. Mm-hmm. And, and so if you want to change barrels, the change magazines, you're rock and roll. You can go with all of it. Um, and then, yeah, just the way the, the, the execution, um, of the actual making of the parts that they're made well, they fit together well. And then the, the final finish and, and mm-hmm. heat treat and all that stuff and the materials that are used that are hard and durable. Like that's, that's what I go for. Awesome. That's yeah. Good things to think about, especially a very mechanical engineer type of answer. Right. Shouldn't have yeah. expected. <laughs> they got clearance, clearance for dirt, you know, you know, you can, you can run them dirty, you can run them wet, you can, and not have to worry about reliability that way awesome mine's a little simpler i just like interchangeable bolt heads a 700 footprint and the ability to take a lot of prefits yeah, yeah prefits i'd say awesome. that's that's a good point though yeah because if you get uh remington 700 footprint op- opens up your aftermarket to a lot of options that are just plug and play yeah and, and i think and that's a cool transition to have seen the precision bolt gun world go more towards like air 15s where it's legos for Mm grown-ups where you can buy components put it all together at home and and you got stuff that works and and there's no like hand fitting and stuff that that you have to have a specialist do yeah that's cool to see that transition it is yeah building a precision rifle has turned into assembling a precision rifle now obviously there are custom gun builders out there that do way more than anything i could ever do but yeah the ability to get a prefit spin that baby on, check the headspace and go to shooting is right. fantastic. Yep. So I, I have put together an AR. So that's my custom build. Yeah. So, I mean, would you make that comparison? Is, yeah, is building a yeah. custom rifle? Yeah, yeah but, but I would say that doing a bolt action is easier. Easier. Easy. I'd say Way it's easier, easier, Judd. Well, I did have some issues with mine, but we got them, we got them figured out. Yeah, yeah. there's less little, you know, less spring-loaded detents yeah. to fly across the room with a bolt gun. Well, that um, makes me feel better, though. Yeah, just yeah. Making that the, comparison. The getting getting the receiver critical dimensions cut on these custom actions to tolerances that are ridiculous. You know, well less than a thousandth of an inch by with the you know total assembly um, has allowed people to make those prefit barrels, and that's the big jump that that made it able for the end user to just replace barrels willy nilly. Because before it was something that a gunsmith on a lathe had to precision cut the headspace specific to that receiver that rifle now it's plug and play take them off if you can if you can pop a lug nut on your tire you can spin a new barrel on i mean just watch torque specs and you're yeah good. Torque and specs and, headspace. Yeah. and it's really not even a critical the torques 20 to 150 foot pounds i mean get her on there so it don't come loose basically yeah that's that's that simple and for me my I, I like a controlled round feed. I like a, a beefy extractor. I'm not really hung up too much yet on material, uh, not talking stainless 4140, whatever. I'm talking titanium versus a stainless action or a steel action. I haven't got into the titanium game yet. Uh, but if you're into that sort of thing, you can shed some serious weight going to titanium. Yep. Yep. And that's a trade off. Um, and the same thing chrome molly will rust if you, right, if you do don't coat it and you don't oil it, it will rust, but it's generally stronger and tougher than stainless and stainless doesn't rust. So you have, I mean, it will, if you expose it to the right conditions, but yeah. it, it's less prone to, so you can have some maintenance, you know, give me there. And then titanium is super lightweight, but it's a less forgiving material. It's yeah. They tend to be gummy and grabby. They're not super slick. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. They don't like you get them dusty and and dirty and they're not the same as as some of the you know the stainless or chrome okay. ones. You need to keep so, them uh, clean and then the the mating surfaces or the, or yeah, the surfaces gotta keep them touch, oiled. you got to keep them lubed. Yeah. Okay. And so the advantage going to titanium is obviously it's lighter. So if you're building a hunting rifle and weight is a chief concern, you know if you're going through like we mentioned earlier in the podcast, what am I after? What are my, you know, prerequisites here? What are my caliber and cartridge selections? And you go through all this list and at the top of the list is, hey, this thing needs to be light. I'm going on a sheep hunt. I'm going bighorn sheep. I'm going, you know, mountain goat. I'm going something really high altitude where I really am worried about weight. 
probably look at titanium. Yep. Yeah, I think yeah, you could well, say it's eight it, to ten ounces. Yeah, potentially. It's, it's, yeah, it's a half it's, a pound. It's significant. You lift them up, you know. Yeah. Like, I mean, just the receivers, just the actions holding, you know, one stainless, one titanium, exact same profile, and it it blows your mind. So it gives you, yeah, spins your mind for a loop. Put your minds in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Would that affect your cartridge consideration then? I mean, it, I to me, my thought process when you guys are talking through that was recoil. Mm. I'm not a fan. So depending on i guess what you're doing that's, that that would maybe bring me down yeah so a pair of your cartridge selection with your yeah. action weight might be something to think about that's that yep. that gets the wheels turning between the ears here yeah that's the whole the feedback there's a constant feedback you know series yeah. of feedback loops that that go into this that the yeah old OODA loop yep <laughs> but that's but. that's a good point judd yeah cuz if you if you build a 6 pound 300 prc you're going to lose some teeth yeah, you're gonna have to. <laughs> you'll be walking around all messed up because your shoulders are gonna be dislocated. Uh, so you do have to pair that up, and that's a, yeah. that's a good thought. And that's yeah, that's a I think stands to reason. You'll have if you build a six seven pound three hundred PRC, you don't want to with a titanium action. You don't want to shoot that day in and day out in a PRS match where you're gonna burn down two hundred rounds yeah. in a week, or even a, no, a, a rifle that you want to shoot two or three times. That's yeah. about it. And yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of shoot your stuff. So. I don't want to build a gun that, oh, I, you know, I'll shoot two or three to get it zero. I'll check dope at a few ranges and then I'm going to go on the hunt because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to eat that recoil. I'd rather build something that I can shoot all summer long leading up to hunting season or I can shoot just willy nilly going coyotes, prairie dogs. I can shoot a match with it, whatever. Build something that's way more palatable to shoot so then you can actually shoot because I feel like if you can hit your target, that's, that's way more important than hitting it with a giant bullet but you don't want to right. actually shoot it. Yep. And I don't know, that, in my opinion, that's how, how I feel. So there's a ton of good factory actions out there and, and good factory rifles. On the custom side, sky's the limit. Budget is really the limit, but there are tons of action manufacturers out there. More, you know, it's, that's a growing field and mm -hmm. you just get great quality and the quality over the average, you can guarantee you go buy an action, it's going to be good. Um, and we've all got our favorites or the ones we use, but there's a bunch out there from, you know, as affordable as that $600 range to $2,000 right. and, and take your pick, but it all starts with the action. And regardless of which one you choose, if you're going the custom action route, you're going to get a good one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, you're, yeah. it's, it's, you're, you're past the functional difference. Like it's a point of personal preference completely yeah. by that point. So the action's kind of useless without a barrel. So. Let's talk barrels for a little bit because there's some serious selection going on there. Obviously, material, weight, length, flutes, muzzle device, there's a lot that goes into it. So that same kind of feedback loop we talked about at the beginning for choosing caliber and cartridge really applies to barrels too. Right. I guess I'd like to start that one off with how barrels are made. Yeah, that's a group. Yeah. And so there's three, three major flavors. You got button rifling hammer forge rifling, and cut rifling. So with button rifling, you dr you gun drill a hole through the rifle, the blank, the, the barrel. Yeah, through it. And then they'll ream that out. Uh, if it's a, a high-end manufacturer, they'll, they'll polish that. They'll uh, lap that out first. And then they pull a button through it. And so you're not actually cutting rifling. You're displacing the grooves into the bore of the barrel. And so that's the easiest, cheapest way to do it. Okay probably the fastest it fastest like. way yeah so like that's all almost all of your factory rifles that aren't hammer forged because that's probably the second fastest way to do it um are are going to be button rifled and then what what's important there because you button rifling has a spectrum of quality you got the cheapest thing ever up to really good match grade barrels that are just as good as anything else and and it what you're paying for and the difference there is how they heat treat and stress relieve that after the fact. Okay. Uh, and the quality that they put into actually pulling that button through or pushing that button through the barrel. Um, and, and so on the low end, poor stress relief. And you'll, you'll see this in a lot of factory rifles where it'll handle three shots, fine, three to five. But if you sit there and hammer down 10 shots, the first three or five hammer right in the same spot. And then you just start opening up or it'll walk, you know, it'll do something okay. like that. And what, it, what that is, is, pent up stress inside the barrel that's left over from the from that buttoning process 
And as the barrel heats up, it just has that pent up stress and it does Distorts. crazy stuff. Yep. It either swells open at the muzzle or somewhere in, in the bore or it bends or does whatever. So those high end barrels that are button rifled, your match grade ones, they're, they've done a stress relief that eliminates that pent up stress and you can sit there, you can hammer 10, 20 rounds through them. No problem. Okay. Um, and then, so hammer forging, uh, they have a oversized OD and ID. And then they have a mandrel that's a super hard material that is basically the in the reverse of rifling. And then some of them even have the chamber in there. And what they do is they have this giant hammer forge. And, and that's why it, the drawback to hammer forging is the initial setup is considerable. But there's this big hammer forge that's got six or eight jaws that just sit there and pound the barrel. And so you take that big bar of what you started off with and you pound it down around that mandrel and pull that mandrel through as you're hitting the barrel and that's what forms that and so those are usually really tough material because you get that cold work into the into the barrel okay. um, and if you stress relieve those they can be pretty accurate as well and and not susceptible to to heat changing with heat um but they're yeah they're not generally known for being the most consistent down the length of them for boring groove Oh, you get some tight spots or maybe some loose spots right. or more propensity for that to happen. Anyway. Right. Yeah. Higher, yeah. Higher chance of that to happen. Not always, but it can happen. And I think Ruger's really, and several other manufacturers have really kind of dialed that in here lately. Yeah. And well, we're talking about the Ruger American cold hammer forged barrel and that thing, every 6.5 Creedmoor Ruger American I've ever seen in the wild shoots yep. great. The really Ruger good. precision rifles always yeah. shoot great. Yep. Yep. So you can do it right. And, and again, I think on the backside of that. There's a stretch relief process. It, if you get that right, it's golden. Um, awesome. And then what most of us are shooting now are the, the cut rifled barrels. And that's where you gun drill, ream, uh, and then there's a cutter that goes through, cuts a tenth, ten thousandth of an inch off of one groove, goes back, resets, goes to the next groove, cuts a ten thousandth, sh just shaving material away, go all the way around, hit each land, adjust it in, cut it again, cut it again, and you'd get 50 to 100 and some passes per barrel to cut and to shave that rifling out. And in doing that, you never induce stress to the material. So if you start with stress-free material before, you never induce stress into it. Some guys even still do a stress relief after, uh, and then they'll lap those, hand lap those, those blanks. Uh, and that's, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, the, the spectrum, I guess, there's no spectrum there because there's so much time involved with that. You got to be doing it right to make any money at it. Okay. And so the guys that are doing that, they've got it nailed down. Yep. Well, so, and so it sounds like you're, uh, slightly biased to going with cut rifled barrels. That's it's what you the, prefer. Yeah, the precision world. That's kind of they they've been ruled by that for awesome. a long time. So is that does that affect the accuracy, or does it affect lifespan of that barrel, or both? Both, like hammer forged barrels. Hammer forged barrels because they have that cold work in them. They're usually a little tougher and they'll last longer. That's kind of that generally what you'll see. Um, and then otherwise, like a, a properly done button rifle that people care about and they stress relieve it properly, properly done hammer forge barrel and a properly done cut rifle barrel, you'll, you'll see the same accuracy out of the top end products. But the two of those have a spectrum from budget to top end and cut rifle. The only way it makes sense is to have top end. Top end. And yep. so you'll, you'll get your best performance out of those. Well, and that's Are you, I guess you, you, no matter who makes it, it's going to shoot. <laughs> yeah, it's it probably going to shoot I've pretty been damn good. saying this on the podcast a bunch, uh, or I've said it on other podcasts talking about other things, but when I say accuracy over the average, so you're not making a barrel, you're making thousands of barrels. And so you're saying if you, if you just had to dip your hand into a bucket of a thousand barrels and pick a barrel, right. the chances of a cut rifle barrel generally produce, producing a really accurate rifle is likely higher than that of a... Right. hammer forged or a button rifled barrel just because it's yep. stress-free when you start it you don't induce stress doing the cutting and it's just a higher end process yep. altogether right okay so if you're hanging your hat on it and you had to go buy one you're going to yep. spend the same money either way you might look into that uh cut rifled barrel i'll say this though i've got some button rifled barrels that i've had spun oh, yeah. up and i don't know if they shoot great when well, yep. i'm not you know i'm not shooting f class or something i'm just building hunting rifles for the most part or match rifles for plate matches yeah yeah and, and again it's 
match your system to your requirements and if it meets your requirements then rock and roll with it excellent and and back to your point that yeah if you there are i know there's gonna be somebody well my factory blah 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 shoots just as good as any custom blah, blah and they happen for sure absolutely for sure We've they happen that. yeah but you're not gonna guarantee that it's gonna happen yours does that they don't all do that right on that's i've a, had a rifle that shot really good from the factory i yeah. think we all have but yeah and i've had some that were lucky to hit a softball at 100 yards i think we've all had I think those we've too. all had those yeah that's yeah. great well that was super educational i did not know well, all about that we need to talk about length and shape yeah too right yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah and c- composition right because you got yeah you got so, carbon fiber you got carbon fluids fiber, stainless steel chrome molly the whole gamut yeah chrome lining yeah mine's honestly become pretty simple these days if i'm if it's a hunting rifle it's going to be 18 to 22 inches and it's going to be carbon fiber or stainless steel fluted yeah if it's a competition rig it's going to be a truck no axle. contour 26 to 28 inches yeah that, that that is kind of the easy button but i'll say you know going back to judd's point i'm glad he brought this up at the beginning of the podcast there is a big part of me which i guess is incredibly vain because i will do i'll make some barrel choices simply for aesthetics and for no other discernible purpose other than I think it looks cool. But so in those considerations, uh, that same loop we've been talking about, that still applies here. Are you looking for weight savings? Are you looking for a certain velocity? Uh, and for me, I've been a champion of this now as well. There are going to be comments about, I need to shut up about this, but I'm always going for a hunting rifle or even just a, a general purpose kind of all you know utilitarian field rifle. I'm going to go shorter on the barrel than most people because I like to run suppressed and I like ergonomics. No, you don't need to shut up about that. You need to say it more. Say it, <laughs> say it more often. So for me, if I'm building a hunting rifle, if most people are going 24, I'm going to go 22 or 20 or 18. If most people are going 22, you can bet I'm going 20 or 18. Yeah. Uh, I just, I really like the ergonomics of it, especially with the suppressor. And if I need more velocity, then I'll get the appropriate cartridge to do that. Uh, and then f- just like Preston said for the match game, I'm going real heavy, pretty long. Yep. I get free velocity with the barrel length and I get some added weight because usually, you know, a heavier rifles a little bit easier to, I can mess up more and still hit the target because yep. I have a heavier rifle. Yep. I think, that, and that, that, uh, heavier rifles dampen the, what do you say? The frequency of. It just, yeah, like it dampens the, the, uh, importance of you being absolutely perfect and consistent behind the gun. Yeah. Lighter rifles theoretically can shoot just as good as heavier rifles. They're just harder. It's just harder on your end to do exactly the same thing every time. And I shouldn't say no contour because some of them have some contour, but I have others that have What I look at, what I look at for that is getting balance point right getting the balance point where I want oh, it. Oh, that's a consideration and for barrel length front, and front weight. Front to back yeah. on the, on the fore end of the stock. Yep. That's good. Here. Now, Miles, obviously you have a depth of knowledge that none of us have. Talk us through the difference in material between like a stainless barrel, uh, a, a chrome lined barrel and a chrome molly barrel. Um, from a material standpoint, is there an advantage either way? Is there a cost difference either way? I don't know. Anymore, it seems like the chrome molly, the old, the old saying was that chrome molly would uh, degrade accuracy slower than mm-hmm. stainless. And a stainless would just hit a point and dump. And I don't know. You've shot enough that I don't think you believe that. Yeah. You've taken I've not shot very many failure. chrome molly barrels, though. That's Anymore, it's all stainless. Okay. I think I think I've gone to stainless just for the convenience of not worrying about rust in my bore yeah does it cut nicer on the lathe was one over the other between all the different manufacturers some of them cut good some of them don't okay and you can definitely see that like uh kriegers i'll pick on them not that there's anything wrong with them but they have different chips like oh coming off the yeah lathe. like the chips are like a slinky like yeah. it's a, a totally different material from a lot of the other guys does it cut a little bit harder you think the material's harder uh no if anything I, they cut fine I yeah, mean, they, and cut they shot fine. fine. I it know. just yeah, they shoot good. It's just it's just interesting to see because you're like, oh, that's not what I'm used to seeing. But the chips are just different. So there is definitely different materials. Uh, there's like those. The Bart line has that new material mm-hmm. that uh, lasts longer. Yep. You know, and we've done some testing with that, and it seems to hold up. Um, it's funny you say that about the the chrome molly not degrading accuracy as rapidly, because in my experience looking 
at barrels with bore scopes, it, it, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, like a chrome molly barrel will alligator skin way quicker than a stainless barrel will. I don't know. No? Truthfully, I I don't know. Well, there's so many variables. Because I've, you know, like I said, I've had one chrome molly barrel and I never even got close to shooting it out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in recent memory anyway. Uh, and then there's like, so chrome lining, that's a whole separate thing. That's usually a chrome molly barrel that has been chrome lined. Um, and there, that's, that's not an exact, exact, it's pretty, it's pretty tight, but it's not as consistent on bore and groove dimensions okay. throughout the bore. When you put that plating on, it doesn't go on exactly the same thickness, thickness all right. the way through. But it's but done we're not talking, for accuracy. Yeah, it's yeah. done for longevity. Right, longevity. And that chrome hands, handles the heat and the pressure better than just the, the bare material would. And there's other stuff like some of the 50 caliber machine gun barrels have stellite liners in them and that handles it even better. And that that's purely to extend barrel life, functional barrel life. Yeah. So from the metal in a barrel now we're getting into uh carbon fiber barrels and you know that that segment has grown significantly there's a bunch of of barrels out there now right um proof was kind of i think the first on the market christensen was up there and uh now there's a ton of a ton of carbon fiber barrels available i don't know anything about that other than i get a big muzzle diameter to shoulder my suppressor to and it's light Yep. I, and I love it. And I have not experienced anything negative. Again, I've not chambered barrels, but from an accuracy standpoint, consistency standpoint, I've never had a problem. Yeah. I would say carbon barrels, just by the mechanics of what you're doing, they're cutting that steel blank, same steel blank as any other barrel. They're cutting it super thin, and then they're going back with wet fiber, right? Uh, and they're laying that up and letting that cure. And so it's an epoxy fiber resin composite, think, yeah. right? And they're, they're wrapping the barrel and there's a different proprietary ways that they do that. But, uh, and some of them start with woven fabric that they wrap around the, the barrel as well. By cutting all that material away, I would say you run the risk of those not shooting exactly as tight, but they still shoot pretty damn good. I was going to say, say I've, I've, had... I've not like, uh, yeah, I don't know that I trust them. And this may just be me in the back of my head, a gremlin that doesn't, that's not based on fact, but I don't know that I trust him exactly as much as a, for like PRS competitions for pure accuracy. Don't okay, care yeah. about nothing else. I don't know if I trust him quite as much as a solid steel barrel, but it's pretty, it's pretty dang close. I trust him more than a factory barrel for sure. Yeah, but typ yeah. typically most people are using them for hunting guns yeah. or maybe like an NRL right. hunter, but yeah, I mean, yeah, for for the purpose, for the correct purpose, there's no reason not and to. And the purpose is yeah. to get that large muzzle diameter, right? To, to keep things rigid, but to get weight savings. Yep. Because yep. Ulti ultimate weight savings, you can run a featherweight contour stainless or chrome molly barrel, and you will get lighter than a carbon fiber barrel of the same Absolutely. weight. Absolutely. But you won't be able to thread you if you thread the muzzle. You're going to have to do an adapter stack to get up to common sizes. Okay. Well, and is there is there an advantage to or excuse me a disadvantage to running a pencil weight barrel for for accuracy or for is it handle heat i'm guessing can't be that good yeah it, it definitely is going to heat up faster i th i don't know I, I i don't know how to I, I haven't done enough i don't got enough experience to tell you exactly yes or no this i think the accuracy potential is there i think heat plays a bigger factor into it and i think definitely the rifle overall rifle weight and what we talked about with the heavier Shoot, rifle really. damping out that inconsistency in the shooter I think if you could be perfect with a pencil weight barrel, you probably, of the same quality rifling, I think you could shoot just as good as a heavy one. Okay. But I think you're going to have more heat. In the real world, you're going to have more heat issues. You're going to have more recoil and sensitivity to being consistent issues. Okay. Disclaimer. This is just a thought, not proven yeah. yet. Yeah. I, we should have caveated the whole podcast. That's my, that's that, my opinion. Yeah, we're yeah. just four dudes that like rifles and we like to shoot stuff and, and we like to, to put together cool stuff. So. Yeah. Ton of options out there for barrels now more than there ever has been. So you get that cool custom action. You get that 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 barrel carbon fiber just looks cool. Yeah. It gives you a big mating surface if you're running a suppressor. Uh, you get a you know that that big beefy look. Get the performance of a really accurate heavy barrel, but you get the weight savings. Uh, we didn't talk about fluting. Now that's one of those things that I have made that choice to get a stainless fluted barrel based on pure aesthetics. Gosh, that just looks cool to me, and uh, I don't know. I've made that that decision before, and I 
and have no regrets because they've all shot well. I've heard myths, rumors, etc. I again have no firsthand experience that sometimes fluting a barrel can cause problems. But now after you explained how a barrel's made, uh, it sounds like if you've got some pent up stress in that barrel that wasn't properly stress relieved, and then you cut into it, yeah, it's probably not a good thing. Yeah, you'll see that with uh, the poorly stress relieved button rifled barrels. You'll see fluting will actually you, a measurable a measurable difference in bore diameter will happen. And the same thing happens too with those. If you cut muzzle threads with the sidewall, where you cut those muzzle threads, you, you'll actually be able to see that. Because you'll relieve it. Yeah, you'll relieve that stress and the bore will actually bell out at the muzzle. And accuracy goes to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, it does not, doesn't generally like that. If you followed okay. the external ballistics portion that yeah. Jaden was talking about, how that muzzle exit gas, if at, right at the muzzle end, that partially lets go of the bullet and it's able to slip and that gas is going to escape around it. Yeah. Be all turbulent. Yeah. I'll say this though, back to, you know, me with the button rifle barrel, I've had a button rifle barrel and I had some deep flutes cut into that baby and that thing shot absolutely lights out. It was a seven millimeter barrel, a little wildcat six, five, six years ago, something like that. Yeah. But it shot great. Yeah. Um, so was was that, that, those was flutes that? were so deep that it, they were sharp. Yeah, it was, was amazing. That was yeah. a cool looking barrel. And again, if the stress relief is right and everything works out just fine, then it works out. So yeah. it, you can get away with it for sure. And especially like I would be less uh, apprehensive on a cut yeah. rifle barrel for sure. But generally, I, I think for the money that you end up paying for fluting, I just go with a lighter contour for free. Yeah. Well, you then could. you don't look cool. Well, I think, <laughs> I think fluting was the original carbon fiber. You right. Know, yeah. And, so, you know, before yeah, carbon let's, fiber was let's a talk thing. about that. Generally, if you wanted to reduce weight, you would cut flutes into it or get a lighter contour and cut flutes or cut it shorter or right. all three of those. What are, what are the advantages of fluting a barrel, if any, other than it just looks really cool? Uh, does it help it cool? Does it help with anything else? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it theoretically, it dis dissipates heat better I mean, because fin, there's more surface that's what, area. That's why you have fins on all your heat sinks in your computer. And, you know, that's basically you're putting fins on your barrel. So, yeah, okay. it will, if there is airflow over it, it will cool faster. Now, whether that's meaningful or not, that's up for yeah. debate. But, but again, another one of those theoretical things, but no getting around it. Looks cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and there's, there's a, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, as we were having that conversation, I was thinking through uh, the rifles that I own. And the only thing fluted that I own is my 50 cal muzzle loader. But I'd imagine that's probably just for the weight reduction because I'm not burning that thing no, down. No, I would say weight yeah. reduction. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. That, just thinking through the muzzle loader that's the only thing i could come I, up now with that, that i'm thinking fluted. about it i have some rifles that are but my muzzle loader is my inline is also fluted yeah that's wild looks cool i that, guess see <laughs> that looks cool look good feel good shoot good yep and there's cool there's guys out there doing some insane like dimpling patterns well we got our mike jensen here that did the took an end mill and plunged it in a like a honeycomb pattern and there's cool st and it's yeah it does look cool it's just a lot of work and you end up paying for that. Yeah, and, that's true. <laughs> but it looks cool. It does yeah. look so, cool. So, yeah, in summary, as always, what are you doing? What are your accuracy concerns? What kind of game are you after? And how light or heavy do you want this rifle system to be? And let that dictate your barrel for you. We're big fans of carbon fiber here, big fans of cut rifling here. Uh, and we, uh, yeah, we're always uh, looking for new ways to look cool. So maybe consider fluting or going carbon fiber. Uh, for me, I'm always going short like always, but uh, uh, I love running a shorter carbon fiber barrel. You get, with appropriate cartridge, you get the velocity because of the right cartridge, short barrel ergonomics, shoulder the suppressor, looks great. You just can't go wrong with that. And I've I'll, got an 18-inch 6.5 PRC that should be built today. Love it. Well, and you've also got a, a barrel coming uh, from a manufacturer that's going to be on the shorter side and fluted. Uh, that's going to look really nicely. What's that going to end at the muzzle at? 800? 830, 850. So 830, let's say, 8, 850 at Somewhere the muzzle. Around there. So it's a pretty big contour, but you're getting those nice, appropriately and, and they, deep flutes. And, they, and it's, a, it's an HS barrel. They they flute deep. Yep. And their accuracy is world-renowned. Oh, that rifle. Barrels. Stainless. It'll yep. be great. Yeah. So that's gonna, I'm excited to see how that rifle comes out. It's going to look pretty neat. So there's our barrel. There's our action. And trigger wise, uh, we've said this a bunch on this podcast. Now more than ever, you need an aftermarket trigger. Bing, bang, boom, done. It's it's that easy. It's that quick. And there's a bunch on the market. 
the two that come to mind for the general purpose use, not for, I mean, there's a bunch out there that do great things, but you buy a factory rifle or you're building a custom rifle for, for hunting or for plinking around or whatever, you got Timney and Trigger Tech are really, uh, from a volume standpoint, you know, if you went to a big box store, there's a chance they're going to have a Timney Trigger yeah, on the shelf. I don't, I don't, it's amazing to me sometimes seeing the rifles that Timney makes triggers for. They make yeah. something for everything. For everything. Ruger Predator. The Ruger they Predator. <laughs> That's right. And so uh, the the trigger game, like I said, there's a ton of brands out there that just make absolutely outstanding triggers. But that same feedback loop, how light do you need that trigger to be? How rugged do you need that trigger to be? What conditions are you going to be using that in? And let that dictate, you know, what trigger selection you make. But, you know, I'm, I've grown parcel here recently to those trigger techs because they just are so smooth. Uh, you don't have to reduce the pull weight to really get a nice sensitive feel on the trigger. Uh, you don't have to reduce it too much anyway, but they make models that you can get them down to breathe on them light. Um, from a trigger weight standpoint, for me, whether I'm running any brand out there, you name it, or a factory trigger that's been tuned up, for me, I like to run my match rifles at 12 ounces. And you know, that seems hyper, hyper light, but there's a lot of folks out there that run half of that. But for a field style plate match, I like to run it at 12 ounces, maybe 14, 16 ounces, depending on the trigger. Now for my hunting rifles, I like to run those between a pound and a half and two pounds. And then I have a high performance muzzle loader and that thing's at two and a half pounds just because our muzzle loader season here in Nebraska is in December. And there's times I've not been able to fill my fingers yep. uh, out there on a hunt. So I like to run a little bit heavier trigger, which in the grand scheme of things is actually pretty light. But that's me and my trigger. What are you guys looking for uh, for your triggers on your custom rifles? Match rifles, I'm 8 to 12 ounces. Hunting rifles, I'm probably 2 to 2.5, maybe pound and a half to 2.5. Like, uh, run pound and a half, 2 pounds on match stuff. And then like ARs, I'll run 3.5. Uh, I didn't mention the ARs thing because I... Just three and a half yeah, there. Was that three and a half? Yeah, three and a half to four. Yeah, I've watched. I've watched people get DQ'd over some. I have too. Accidental slam yeah. Yeah, double if fires. If you're running an AR in a in a sanctioned match. Yeah, make sure your trigger's not gonna double up on you. So are you running a pound and a half for matches and hunting? Just kind of that's where you like to pound run. and a half, two pounds. Yeah, pretty much everything there. Yep. Fair enough, Judd. I run a trigger here. that functions. Yeah, sure. that's. True. I think we did turn down. The Predator, though, I think we took it down to about two pounds or something. You don't have a Timney in there yet? No, I yet. do not. Not yet. Notice I, I said yet, but yeah, yeah. Well, it's great that the factory rifles bit. come with a user-adjustable trigger. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of them, and that's that's one thing that things have constantly improved over the last several years, or, yeah, yeah I mean, several decades, but factory rifles are coming with better and better triggers all yep. the time. Yeah. yeah. That's a big, that's a really important factor in the shootability of a gun, in my opinion. Uh, so again, triggers, we're not partial to any one brand. There's a bunch of them out there. You know, we've all got kind of the ones we like. Uh, shifting gears now to one of the funner aspects of, of picking a rifle uh, or building a rifle, in my opinion, yeah, you know, I've kind of got the actions down. I know which ones I like. I got my barrels down to pretty much, you know, kind of a standard. I love choosing a rifle stock to me whether that's a, a factory rifle i'm kind of configuring for something else or a completely custom for me i geek out a lot on rifle stocks and i don't know nothing about how they're made but i know how they feel in my hand and uh for me that is one of the more enjoyable aspects of building a rifle is because to me that's that's one of the biggest benefits of building a custom rifle is getting something that fits you perfect uh cheek weld length of pull uh, whether or not it, you know, got a little thumb shelf on there, and how it interacts with the bag and the center, you know, balance point. I just, I just love it. I think, yeah, the only way to do that perfectly right is to hand carve one out of walnut. <laughs> we will talk about that because we, yeah. Speaking, speaking of, of so, uh, before we get into that though, uh, what are some considerations that you guys run through your head when you're picking out uh, a rifle stock or trying to pick something? out for a, a specific purpose for me initially it was i used to run chassis for the match guns i switched over to stocks for me it's when i put my hand on that vertical grip i want my pinky to have some material well let's qualify this for people not watching on youtube you're six four with a size 
you know, whatever hand. I, I think they're normal. I do wear XL gloves, whatever. <laughs> I think they're appropriately sized for your height, <laughs> but uh, but that's a big hand. And so that's a big consideration for you, for you and for yeah, other people I, out there. I don't want my pinky hanging off. If I have these fingers on the grip, I want my pinky to be on there too. Sure. I want it to be included. Mm-hmm. I'm very yeah. inclusive. Uh, I do like a thumb shelf. It's not a requirement. Uh, and then for me on, on a match gun now, that stock has to have a fairly wide forend okay. just so it rides a bag a lot better too. Yep. awesome and so you switched from chassis to stock is that because you finally found some stocks that fit you or do the chassis weren't working no the, way I, the, the chassis was just a way uh, at the time i i had limited action or options because it my first competition gun was a howa that shot fantastically but limited options as far as aftermarket stocks and chassis go Okay. So if you wanted a competition stock for it, they didn't really exist, and and I could get a chassis almost as cheaply, and I wanted to try it, so I just okay. started there. So then you went stocks. Now on a hunting rifle, obviously you're still running stocks for a hunting rifle. Um, what kind of considerations are you putting into that? Is oh, weight? it's got to be under two pounds. Okay. Personally, it's got to have pillars or mini chassis whatever you have and my pinky has to right on the grip and you like a vertical grip there still yeah still you don't like the traditional lines of a hunting rifle with more of a horizontal wrist might as well just keep everything the same throughout all of my shooting that makes sense judd not super technical at all i'd say probably weight was, looks weight was my consideration and then yeah looks you know the spider webbing's cool carbon fiber's cool but i'd say from the hunting perspective that i primarily take is is probably weight yeah, yep. so you're definitely more of a function guy. Yeah. yeah you yeah, want yeah. to look cool, but it's got a function. Uh, for me personally, I started also in the chassis game. Uh, I built my first match rifle in 2013 in a stock, uh, and that was just a factory barreled action, Then I kind of changed some things out here and there. When I built my first ground-up custom rifle, I, uh, I won a chassis at a shooting competition. It was back in 2014, uh, Thunder, Thunder Beast put on the... Uh, sniper adventure challenge and uh our senior ballistician Jaden quinlan and i we ran the sprint class i think that was the last year they did a sprint and we won that division and uh i won that chassis and built a rifle in there and it was awesome and i loved it and man i burned it down for a while with that thing and then i i made a transition into a match rifle stock mainly because i found a stock shape material and all that that just i was like wow i've been missing out this is way more comfortable cheek welds better more consistent my thumb placement more consistent i just shoot better on this thing and i've grown as a shooter since then but i went on the stock route for hunting i'll jump right in there with you Preston. i'm looking for sub two pounds i love to keep it adjustable if i can uh, but i've gone to running arca four ends on my hunting rifles as yep. well as my match rifles. so i've got to have a hunting stock with a four end wide enough that it'll accept you know a, a two to four inch uh, 1.5 inch dovetail Arca so that I can slip that in and out of a tripod. You know, for me, that's my, my things. I, I love a thumb shelf on there and carbon fiber looks cool. Yeah. I was going to hit on the thumb shelf too. So just to go a quick little backstory here, and I don't know if this is relatable or not, but I think it's from shooting the super light seven mag that I used to have. I used to have a death grip on that thing when I shoot it. And now it's like, it's stuck with me. So I don't own one that has a, a thumb shelf on it, but after just shooting rifles around here and probably shooting your guys' rifles, it's it's a spot to like just in my head go, don't don't have that death grip. Put your thumb here. Yeah. So th- that's something I try to work well, you on. Put your it's, thumb over there, and it's it's hard to death grip yeah. it at all. Well, so that's it yeah. Just the makes whole you, point gives you a better trigger press. You roll that thumb over there, and you can have a tendency to to input torque into the rifle and and twist it. And then it wants to recoil funny. Uh, And I felt, and I don't, yeah, right, wrong, or otherwise. And a lot of people do this in the shooting community. So uh, 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong here. uh, You put the thumb over on that other side and it just helps me manipulate the trigger consistently and and better um, for me. I think that's going to be a huge consideration as little as it is when I do my custom rifle build that that's a thing that's important to me is that thumb shelf just to try and break me from really wrenching on 
Yep. So, we're going to yep. do it here shortly. Yeah, here in the next couple of weeks when we start getting <laughs> yeah. parts ordered. Yeah, exactly. Hey, exactly. hunting season's around the corner. Yeah. yeah. Try to get one spun together. Uh, so for me, I, I really like a thumb shelf. I really like carbon fiber for a hunting stock. For a match stock, I'm going heavy. Um, the stock I'm running right now on my match rifle is a Manor T2A Gap with a heavy fill. And that thing's a beast, but it's super comfortable. And like you said, Miles, it dampens out, helps helps even out my inconsistency and still, you know, hit consistently on target, which is, which is great. But uh, I do like pillars. Um, I've installed some myself. I've got some rifles that just come factory installed. It's not that big of a job, uh, but very important in my opinion. Um, and I've shot a bunch of stocks. I still have them with full yeah, either mini chassis or you know those you know aluminum accuracy bedding aluminum blocks. bedding blocks in there. I think that's important too. Uh, but there's a bunch of good options. We've said it now. This is like the eighth time. There are a ton of good options out there today. When you rewind three, four years ago, even wasn't this right. full of a market of amazing quality products. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's something out there for you. And uh, another thing that is a consideration is length of pull. You know when you start looking at custom rifles and custom stocks now you get to dictate that you know my wife's five foot tall so when it's time for her to to get a custom rifle i can get the 12 inch length of pull that's right for her uh for her arm length uh or you know preston's six foot four he needs 14 and a half inches of length of pull that you can get those those options and it you know it just makes it easier yeah. and it makes it that much better it just turns it just past the click where Right. Everything really becomes that much more comfortable and that much more consistent. Yeah. So now that's we're something. Well, no, that's something that resonates with me because I remember I'm five foot six and a half, you know, and going to buy a factory rifle for me was like, well, I love everything about this rifle except it's got a 14 inch length of pull and it is too long. It's not comfortable, mm-hmm. and that would dictate choices. You know, like, well, I guess I'll take option B because it fits worth a dang. Mm-hmm. So. Well, now you're but into... But now we have to get out the scotch and the leather-bound books. <laughs> yeah. Miles of Rich Mahogany. All right. So, first, Miles, before we get into what we're all alluding to, <laughs> walk us through some of your rifle stock considerations, and I'm guessing you'll have more of a engineering-type mindset to this than, we, you know, us guys just talking about it's comfortable and it looks cool. And then we'll get into, yeah, hand carving an $800 block of walnut. It wasn't that bad. Uh Excuse me. Well, uh, yeah, I like I like the Manners McMillan vertical grip stuff. That's that's what I started with with the precision rifle stuff, and uh, it's always been what's felt the most comfortable, the most natural to me. Uh, and the big things for me are length of pull, uh, getting the comb to the right height, and then another big one because I've got the opposite of Preston's hands. I got pretty stubby little hands here. Uh, is actually getting the distance from the front of the grip to the trigger. Oh yeah, short enough that I can. Get your finger comfortably in there. reach the trigger, yeah, and get get the my finger pad on the trigger in the right spot. Excellent. Um, I prefer flat four ends and and just a solid slope from the front of the bottom metal all the way up to the to the front, and that lets you do bags right easier. You can put arca rails on them and stuff. I I've not gone into like you have with putting arca rails on my composite or hunting stocks. I haven't got there yet. Um, for competition, I've there's a couple, KRG has a chassis that I like, the Bravo and the X-Ray, those full, all those fit to me more like a traditional stock than, like all the AR-15 pistol grip chassis, I can't, not into it. can't hack it, yeah, okay. not not for me, um, I know, obviously it works for a ton of people, but yeah, I just, it's a different enough for me that I just haven't acquired that taste, um, so yeah, and then the main one that I run is the American Rifle Company, um, Zylo. Zylo, yeah. Yep. And that's got like all the technical features, got all the adjustability you want, uh, got an arc of rail, the whole length M- or uh, M lock, you know, you can put weight kits in it, all that, all that jazz. So, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say it's the prettiest thing in the world, but, uh, it's form over, yeah, function, function, function over form, function over form. Yeah, definitely. Like and it came it fit, off the spaceship. Yeah. Fit, it fits everywhere that it's supposed to, has the adjustability that it needs and has all the features that it needs. And functionally for the prs nrl competition that's uh it yeah fits a ticket for me awesome well speaking of nrl let's jump to nrl hunter uh because a little over a year ago you decided that your beautiful gun that you built for nrl hunter competitions wasn't good enough this thing was custom from end to end had the perfect stock that you wanted had the action had the barrel 
yeah, I mean, everything about this thing was cool. And you're obviously a great competitor. So you decided you're going to make your own stock. Walk us through what happened there. Yeah. So like uh, how you guys were talking about, you sit in a desk all day and you dream up these ideas. Um, and I found a website that had like some amazing uh, walnut blanks, uh, gun blanks for, for making stocks and was browsing through there. And I was like, wow, that'd be pretty cool. Like, you know, someday maybe that'd be cool to make my own stock. I've never done a full on stock you know making building but i've done a bunch of inletting uh done barrel channels whatever action closet stock yeah mainly. action inlets yeah and so the, the difference woodworker right the difference yeah the difference between composite and wood is composites you can fill it in with some gas tank repair putty and cerakote over it and nobody knows the difference with yeah. wood you cut it wrong and there it is like, yep forever you're not putting that back yeah uh but anyway, yeah, I, and then I wanted, um, I guess, to your point on pillars, and to my point, to make it easier, action inlets are probably one of the more complex things because you're using a three-axis mill to put in a cylinder in the wrong direction to cut a cylinder on a mill, um, you know, to get the yeah. round bottom for like a M700 inlet. Um, so uh, I'm sure there's all sorts of tricks and ways to do it with what I had available. It, wasn't going to be easy like a cnc machine would have made it easy but it didn't have it wasn't going to put wood pulp in the guy's coolant I don't yeah. know, <laughs> they would, wouldn't have appreciated that um so anyway i uh got a uh, talked to american rifle company they actually had a i think a prototype xylo chassis and i was like hey you guys you know you guys can i have that you know can i buy that from you and we worked out a deal and uh, just chopped it, basically. and then Cut the stock off, cut the fore end yeah, off. Yeah, cut the front and back off, uh, and then just milled milled and filed around that and got, got it cut down to a mini chassis. And then that was a rectangle inlet, basically, that I could just cut a really basic shape into the wood. And so I said, all right, well, screw it, we'll do it. And so bought the blank. It was, I think, $650. Which is a really cheap block of walnut, all things considered. I've yeah. been to a place where there's a old gentleman close to 80 years old i think that hand carved stocks i don't know what they cost but he had blanks with price tags on them over two thousand yeah. dollars for the blank it, it's pretty they easy. looked wet like i thought they were dripping water hanging on the wall because the wood grain was just amazing and super high polish yeah yep. so you, you get an af i'm going to use air quotes here an affordable block of walnut right this was this was cheap enough that I could justify it to myself that even if it didn't turn out perfect, I could pay 650 bucks for a stock and you know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Not the end of the world if I screw it up. Yeah. So I mean, you, it's not good, but it, I could, I could stomach that once. So you, you know? go to hacking on this thing with your, basically your mini chassis. Yeah. Yeah. So I cut up my mini chassis uh, and then got, went out to the bandsaw and cut big chunks off of this blank and, and then deck the top, did the inlet, got the, they got the mini chassis to fit into it. Uh huh. And then epoxy that in there. Yeah. Glued that in there and then got, well, I had to keep it out so that I could test fit everything. Uh, and, but eventually, yeah, I got to hitting on it with rasps and files and chisels and carved away most of it. Uh, had John Cerakote that mini chassis for me and then glued that in place. Uh, yeah. And then, Wow. Well, let's talk about some of the design <laughs> aspects because it's, yeah, that's cool that you weren't previously weren't a woodworker and had really high end machinist skills and basically just applied those to this block of wood. Right. But you did some cool stylistic things that isn't being done. So this isn't just like a, you know, a Macmillan A5 shape or, right. you know, whatever. This is got some World War II type of, oh. uh, type of, design into it and it just looks super cool yeah. talk us through some of those design aspects uh yeah so for if, you, if general form looks like if you want to look up a, a swedish cg63 mauser uh it's like a swedish competition rifle it was they built off 1896 mausers and i've always loved the way those look it's still got a round top hand guard made out of walnut and then a you know a barrel band up at the front and so i was like well you know i've got full artistic freedom here i'll i'll make that you know see if i can and, uh, but yeah, for the grip, it, it's a generally like a vertical grip, not far off of like what a manners is, but it's a little beefier. Um, and what I did was just took my hand and touched the stock wherever I hit wood, I'd mark that, shave that away and keep doing that until basically my whole hand fit comfortably at the angle I wanted it to. 
So it's just a one-to-one -one fit with my hand. And then Beautiful. I cut a, cut a little thumb shelf in there. Uh, the length of pole is perfect for me. Probably not anybody nice, else. Nice, soft, cushy recoil pad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I put a... Well, it's it's theme. It's theme. It, it is. It's theme. great. What it's is great. the recoil pad? It's, a, it's not a pad. It's a, <laughs> a Mauser 98 flat butt plate. From the old, I mean, it's new yeah, old stock. Yeah, new from... old stock, but yeah, it was, it was just the Mauser 98 style flat butt plate. And then I have a laser engraver at home and I engrave some texture on the back. So it has a little bit of grip. Yeah. So you've but got a... Those have always fit me. I don't, I, I've talked to people, they're like, what, what's wrong with you? Like those hurt and they've always fit me fine. And it's yeah. a six, five Creedmoor. So it, the recoil is not bad. You can, yeah. Yeah. But you've got like a hundred year old piece of metal hand carved yeah and had to, had to fit that up and it's a pretty one-to-one -one fit yeah that that took some doing but and this whole project didn't happen overnight this was a year year and a half of me once yeah. a month getting getting the courage up to start cutting on this piece of wood well it was but, an expensive block of wood and you did phenomenal i don't know if we could use that rifle stock maybe in the thumbnail for this podcast so somebody could see <laughs> it but yeah with the enclosed fore end being wood and then just the obviously it's a beautiful piece of wood yeah, which the is figure in there is yeah really... polished to uh you know super super buttery smooth and uh got the stain or the the sealant on there would yep. you use Danish uh, oil? tongue oil tongue oil yep uh just looks super cool and then you dropped in a mini chassis which you can't really see but it's like holy cow that's cool and then you've got a high-end custom action the uh, the mm. arc mousing field yep yep mousing field with a proof research proof research carbon fiber yep and uh now you've got a rifle that just transcends a bunch of different eras in shooting, and you're using it for NRL competitions. You make power factor with the 6.5 Creedmoor, and with one of your first few matches you shot with it, you won the division. Yeah. Open light. Yep. At, got first at a place recent open match light here. here yep. that's, that's just wicked. So talk about, I mean, that is the pinnacle of custom that we just talked about. I, uh, not the pinnacle. I think well, people, no. there's people out there that could do it better than I did, but. Well, yeah, but at least around this table. <laughs> you did it yourself and yeah. that's what's cool. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, uh, so that's kind of rifles as a whole. We didn't talk about feeding mechanism, magazine drop, or excuse me, magazine or a hinge floor plate. That's something to be mindful of hunting rifles. You know, a lot of folks love to go with the hinge floor plate. So you're not, you know, worried about losing a magazine. Yep. Uh, that's uh, one point, I guess I like doing chassis and mini chassis wherever you can, because then the magazine presentation is controlled yeah. much better than a separate bottom metal piece. Uh, if you get the fitting wrong on that bottom metal and the height of your pillars, you'll have magazine feeding issues yeah. that, and you'll end up, you'll see guys bend in magazine feed lips and all that. Usually if you get a mini chassis that's set up right, it, you don't have to worry yeah, about plug it. Plug and play. Plug and play. Yeah. And speaking of plug and plug and play, Preston alluded to it earlier. We talked about it just a bit. Pre-fit barrels. You know, these action manufacturers are manufacturing things to such tight tolerances that you can get a shouldered barrel, no barrel nut adjustments, just a shouldered, traditionally cut barrel that you can just thread on. And there's a bunch of action manufacturers and a bunch of barrel makers that are now, and, and gunsmiths that are chambering barrels that you can just buy and assemble. And Judd, to me, that's what makes it easy for guys like us that are not Miles to build a custom rifle. Yep. Build. Yeah, quote, unquote, quotation. build. So before we wrap this thing up here, we've talked about custom rifles and configuring a factory rifle into something semi-custom. I want to hear, Judd, what you're thinking. If you were, if you were today going to start assembling stuff, what are you thinking about action, cartridge, uh, stock? What are you thinking about if you, would, if you had to get a gun built today. If you had to order all the parts today, what what's your, walk us through your feedback loop here. What are you shooting? <laughs> what are you building it for? Um, that kind of thing. I'll put you on the spot here. Well, I think I might have to go uh, over lunchtime today and hit the interwebs and do some prowling. But I think for me, I, I definitely want to go carbon stock and probably the same on the barrel. Uh, for weight, maybe on the barrel but also appearance just just cool looks factor. cool I don't, I don't have a carbon barrel so i, I gotta Got i gotta it. get one well and you shoot suppressed so you can and go I a little shoot shorter suppressed, so i think i would go a little bit shorter okay. around the 20 inch i have a 22 with my seven inch can it's it works it's just long i mean you know the deal mm -hmm. uh as far as trigger that's the one thing that i just i've never had a you know uh uh, custom trigger or an aftermarket aftermarket trigger. I 
that's one thing so I, you have to I don't bounce know. around the office and yeah feel exactly some go, go feel some triggers yeah uh i don't know i just as far as caliber goes and cartridge goes i've shot one elk in my 30 years of living so how often am i going to shoot something that size probably more deer antelope coyote prairie dog so i don't think i would go with a 30 right I'd probably seven potentially six five but I, I think seven after having a seven mag for a while i really did like that so okay. i think seven is probably where i'm thinking uh cartridge to be determined but there's some good ones out there uh sounds like a cool uh, build so far yeah other than i don't you know i gotta get the ball rolling yeah here, let's but. get that action bill what, what, what are you gonna go for an action what are you thinking probably more I'm, affordable on the budget end or going custom or are you doing factory so that depends. I have been known to be a Tika man. Oh. So I do like the Tika actions and they're super smooth. So I don't know. Can I go against my Tika roots or not? Or go with, uh, yeah, something like a, a big horn or, or what? You, you yeah. got options because Tika has actually got a lot more aftermarket support yeah. now. Yeah, they do. So. Well, and it's hard not to want to go with something custom just because you know, you know, you know what you're getting and. Obviously, Zermatt Arms is here in Nebraska. It's nice to support local, but there's a ton of great options out there. We mentioned Mac Bros, Stiller, um, Bat. I mean, the list Impact, goes on and on and on. Lone Impact, Peak. Impact Lone Peak. Goes, as, yeah. as component snobby as I am, I can't look down on a Tika. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. saying something. Back to my roots. Back to your roots. <laughs> Back yeah. to your Heard roots. Boots. Yeah, I don't know. So basically, yeah, I need to hit the interwebs and do some prowling and go around the office, look at stuff. I mean... I think that's that's the biggest thing. If you got if you know anybody or can go to a match or can get out and find people that have things that you think you might want to try, see if you can get your hands on it and see if it actually is. Because there's been I, I don't know I'm sure you guys are the same way. You see stuff on the internet, you're like, oh man, that picture looks awesome. You know, I that's that's what I want. And then you get it and you're like, not really what I want. Yeah, this isn't really as good of a fit as I thought it was going to be. And you can save yourself that cycle of buy it at msrp and sell it for less used and yeah. then go buy the next thing you can save yourself a couple cycles of that you can go try it out play with somebody else's toys first <laughs> it's always well, great the other fun thing here that i was thinking about throughout this conversation too is and i want to hear from you guys what finish or what colors are you going are you guys going cerakote are you rattle cannon are you stainless steel are you blued on the stock, are you red, white, and blue? Are you orange? I, I, I want to hear what you guys like. I keep it real simple. I've done some stuff where I've done full Cerakote. Like my muzzle loader is a, a custom smokeless muzzle loader built on a Remington 700, and that is Cerakoted. Uh, I have a stock that's got a tricolor camo to it, so it's tan, brown, and OD green, and so the barreled action Cerakoted uh, flat dark earth. So th it looks pretty cool. For the most part, I, whatever action I go with and it shows up a color, that's the color it stays. And I kind of do the same thing with barrels too. Stock wise, I'm not super extravagant with colors. Um, you know, I really keep things kind of earthy toned for the most part. Minus, I do have a rifle stock that I shoot for competition uh, from uh, HS Precision and it is black and red, but Hornady cheering on the black and the red looks great. So, other than that, I keep things pretty earth toned. I've been known to just throw some spray paint on stuff. <laughs> I'll Cerakote it, I'll Duracoat it, but I'll also just rattle can it. Yeah, I think if I'm going to go through, if I want camouflage, I usually favor lighter colors, tans for the most part. Yeah, tans a little bit better. Tans, tans, grays, and greens are good. And uh, most of the time anymore, though, I'm kind of with Seth. I just put it together and I change barrels often enough that I just leave those the way they, they look come. better scratched up if they're stainless rather than scratched up and painted yeah yeah so big big fan of what you got going there yeah well i i would say i enjoy that part almost just as much too as far as just if i'm on cerakote's website just going through colors and whatnot and i, I had a shotgun cerakote that was uh turned out great yeah like a burnt bronze type color i can't remember the exact color but man it it looks cool so that part to me aside from the whole whole build I'm excited about decking it out. You know, look good, shoot good. So, yeah, uh, it, I'm excited about that. Yeah, look yeah. good, feel good, shoot good. Yeah. That's yeah. There's a lot of truth to that, whether we like it or not. 
Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about before we wrap up? Uh, I don't know, custom rifle and, and rifle component considerations. I think yes, yeah. Build build the rifle for for the purpose that you know that you want to use it for, and and match everything up so that it makes sense for what you're doing. And then, like I said, try to get out and try all that stuff before you buy it sight unseen. That's the main thing. If I you got. want to, if there's you want to, a yeah. lot of good factory yeah, options out. That's yep. true. Getting better every year. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks for for shooting the breeze with me over here. I I feel like you know we're getting closer to hunting season now, and and we're always shooting matches and stuff. And anytime I can talk guns or hunting or whatever, it just it keeps yeah keeps my my wheels turning in my head, and and I'm always trying to dream up the next best thing and build the next coolest rifle. And and yeah, this is gonna help fuel that fire, Judd. Let's uh, let's get out of here and go start picking out some rifle components <laughs> for you. Sold. I'm in. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, guys. Everybody that stuck with us on this one, we appreciate you listening, and we'll catch you on the next one.